Hello and welcome. What role will robots play in future warfare and is there a question of ethics in fighting battles this way? Remote control wars might sound like science fiction, but they're already a part of 21st century reality. The number of unmanned machines has increased dramatically, with over 40 countries developing combat robotics programs. When the US invaded Iraq in 2003, they only used a handful of robotic planes. Today they're using more than 7,000 unmanned aerial systems, commonly known as drones. Robots used on the ground have also shot up, with up to 12,000 being used to dismantle homemade roadside bombs. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Robots are getting more sophisticated by the minute. Coming soon are machines that can pick up wounded soldiers and take them to safety. And insect-inspired micro-air devices able to survey dangerous places inaccessible to ground vehicles. Israeli technology in particular is way ahead with unmanned boats capable of speeds that would make a human sick. And its Guardian unmanned ground vehicle drives itself as it monitors the Gaza and Lebanese borders. Well, many are excited by these innovations, but others say the absence of humans will make the idea of starting a war more acceptable. So today we ask, how will the robotic revolution affect the future of modern warfare? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can send an SMS or an email, and we also welcome your phone calls onto the show. Joining me on the program to discuss this is Dr. Peter W. Singer, who served as a defense policy advisor to President Obama's election campaign. His most recent book is Wired for War, The Robotics Revolution and Conflict in the 21st Century, which is on the official reading list of the U.S. Army. We also have Philip Alston, the United Nations Special Representative on Extrajudicial Killings. He's a professor at New York University Law School and faculty director of its Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. Gentlemen, I welcome you to the show. And uh, Dr. Singer, if I could start with you there, sir. Uh, what are the most advanced technological developments out there right now? What is it that's out there that we, well, we're not really getting a full sense of yet as the general public? Well, I think what's interesting is that so many of these things that seem like science fiction are playing out in reality. And it's not just merely the platform, it's the capabilities of the platform. So a good example of this is the Predator. Uh, it's a drone that a lot of people are familiar with, but what they may not be familiar with is its evolution. Uh, there's no pilot inside, and that's the way people think about it. But the first one was completely uh, remotely operated. Humans sitting somewhere else made it take off and land on its own, controlling all of its actions. The new generation of it, the Reaper, can take off and land on its own, can also fly waypoints on its own. It even has target acquisition software that can identify footprints in a field and backtrack where those footprints came from. So the big difference in history here is the technology is not just getting more lethal or can go faster or farther, it's getting smarter. And Dr. Singer, what, what, what pace is that development, of the rate of advancement increasing at? It's exponential. It's multiplying upon itself. And the way to think about this is something that they call in science Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the rule that basically every 18 months or so, our computers, our microchips, have doubled in their power and capacity. And so um, essentially it's doubling again and again and again. And the way to think about this, I think, is a historic example. A lot of people may have received for a uh, birthday or a holiday, those little greeting cards that open up and play a song, or a, a magnet that they put on their refrigerator and it plays a little song. That one device has as much computing power as the entire U.S. Air Force had in 1960. That's the advancement that's playing out right now. Well, let me bring in Professor uh, Philip Alston here. Sir, when you, when you hear or when you see these kind of uh, developments taking place in the military, what concerns uh, come across your mind? Well, uh, I think there are a lot of concerns. The uh, first, the, the biggest concern, of course, is whether these new weapons uh, constitute a, uh, a radically different class of weapons such that different rules need to be developed by international law. But the immediate concern, of course, is the uh, risk that those who are developing these new weapons will actually be building them in such a way as to try to get around some of the existing laws of war, uh, apart, quite apart from the fact that it's increasingly difficult for the existing laws of war to really uh, govern effectively the actions of these, mm -hmm. uh, these robots. But Professor, isn't, there, isn't it a good thing to take people off the battlefield to have soldiers essentially ha out of harm's way? Uh, it is in many respects. Uh, there's no question of that. I guess what we have to distinguish is the uses that we currently see. 
uh, where soldiers are indeed taken out of harm's way. Um, but there is still relatively limited use of these vehicles for what we call targeted killings. Now, I've already made the point that to the extent that they are used outside of armed conflict zones for targeted killings, that's highly problematic and a clear violation. But the bigger risk is that we move down uh, a few years from now and we see these weapons totally automated, in other words, entirely robotic. So there is no human dimension to it other than the construction and the programming uh, of the robots. Uh, then the question is, how are the laws of war going to be upheld? Who's making the decisions? Who can be held accountable? I'll get on to some of those ethical questions in a moment. But let me bring in Dr. Singer and ask, uh, uh, you know, about the the, um, the the areas in which there's the biggest growth. I mean, we've seen the, the uh, huge growth, as you mentioned, uh, in war bots, if you want to call them that, over the past five years. In which areas do you think the, the next five years will really show some progress? I think uh, the miniaturization trend is a big one to keep our eye on. Uh, basically, it's the devices getting smaller and smaller, much like has played out with the computers that people may be familiar with. You know, a computer once filled an entire room, then it fit on your desktop, and then now most of us have computers that we carry around in our pockets. The same thing is happening with robotics, and that's both, you know, a positive story, and you think of all the things that you could do with much smaller machines, but of course it raises very deep concerns about politics, observations, ethics, you know, what does it mean when there could be a little micro-sized device in a room and I don't even know it's there. It's who's using this right. technology. Um, actually, I think the challenge in all of this is that really while the technology is moving at an exponential face, pace, it's going faster and faster, our laws, our human understandings move at a pretty linear pace. Right. And so the challenge, particularly in war right now, is that the laws of war really aren't keeping up. Actually, and, and that's what Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Olson was mentioning, but Dr. Singer, one thing, I guess there's a difference between robotics as used by humans, controlled by humans, uh, and very much uh, machines, I guess, that, that are, are under human control, and, and artificial intelligence where perhaps those machines are making on-the-spot decisions. Exactly. What you're getting into really is a question not of how smart it is, but how much autonomy it has. What is the uh, amount of decision leash that you're giving to it? What decisions do you allow it to make on its own? What decisions do you supervise, manage? And what decisions do you make for it? And that's really part of the, the challenge here is, um, particularly in war, the speed of war is such that you want something to be able to make decisions at an instant from a military tactical standpoint. But from an ethical standpoint, you have to worry about what happens when the machine is making more and more of its own decisions. And I think this is going to be a crucial debate moving forward. And what I find fascinating is it's not just a debate in war, but we're even seeing it in the stock market, for example, where about 50% of the money that's traded in the world right now is traded not by humans, but by computers that have the autonomy to do so. And that, of course, makes people very uncomfortable. But other people go, well, that's the way to make a lot of money fast. This is, I think, a huge debate moving forward. And Professor, Professor Alston, I guess that there is this debate then, once uh, machines have autonomy, where does the accountability stand? Where, I mean, ethically, there's the question of who is held accountable, who's held responsible? Right. I mean, I think uh, Dr. Singer is right to point to the fact that this uh, phenomenon affects a lot of different areas. But of course, there's a very big difference when we're talking about uh, robots that are programmed to kill, uh, perhaps in large numbers, perhaps over very significant areas. And that's where we really need to look at uh, very different rules. Uh, the first problem now, as I, as I suggested earlier, is that there is this enormous scientific development that Dr. Singer has described. But on the side of the laws of war, first of all, those responsible, whether it's the International Committee of the Red Cross or international lawyers generally, have paid remarkably little attention to these issues. And secondly, the people who are developing the weapons have not put, obviously, any priority on trying to design them in such a way as to ensure not just that they comply with the rules of war, which is controversial in some ways, but that they will have built into them the ability to monitor very effectively what's going on and to provide information 
to those who are trying to ensure that the laws of war are respected. And Professor, there was an email question, if I can put it to you, sir. It came in from Portugal. Uh, and the question says, why should war become less ethical just because machines enter the mix? Our lives are dominated by robots anyway, which is true to a large degree. I mean, when it comes down to it, there, are there any actual international conventions in existence that govern the use of any kind of robotics or uh, remote attacks? I know we've had the issue of the drones. We saw some video of the drones attacking uh, areas of Pakistan, for example. Well, I think it would be a big mistake uh, to assume that the basic laws of war, which have been with us for some centuries, and we can actually track one of the most significant developments back to the American Civil War, uh, the Lieber Code of 1863, those rules certainly still apply in terms of the principles. Now, one might assume, hey, come on, we've come a long way since then, they couldn't still be relevant. But the essential principles are that we're not allowed to kill civilians deliberately, that we have to distinguish between them. When we have a military target, we have to make sure that the damage beyond the military target is very limited. Now, the question is whether robots can ever be programmed effectively enough to do that. And even if they can, whether taking the human judgment dimension out of that is ethical or could comply with the rules of the laws of war. Dr. Singer, is it, is it inconceivable to imagine a situation such as the scene from, uh, you know, the Hollywood blockbuster Terminator where you have robots against humans? I mean, on a different, obviously, that storyline was very different with robots rebelling against humans. But, but, but can you imagine a situation where you have a battlefield where robots are pitted against humans one-to-one -one like that? Uh, maybe not one-to-one. -one. I mean, I, there might be some people who in Afghanistan right now who would argue it's a little bit like that when you consider the difference between the technologic levels of, say, um, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda uh, operating against a force that has, you know, F-15s and Predators and Global Hawks and Mark bots and you name it. Um, but, you know, it's, I, I don't think science fiction, in, in some ways it's a great guide, but in other ones, if we're looking at the Terminator movies for true guidance, we're probably going to get it wrong. I think one of the interesting things that um, Professor Alston raises is the real difference with robotics to me in, in the question of ethics is the distancing that they allow. That is, they distance the human operator from the point of action. So the predator may be over Afghanistan, but the human operator is sitting in, say, Nevada in the United States. They also distance them potentially chronologically. So the decisions that a scientist make they may have impact on the battlefield years later on. And the challenge is that international law really isn't set up for this kind right. of distancing, this kind of dislocation. And that's really, you know, it doesn't mean that we throw out international law, but it may need a bit of updating. And I remember going to Human Rights Watch and asking them, for example, you know, what laws do we turn to when, for example, a predator drone strike goes awry? And one of them said, well, the Geneva Conventions. And then another one argued with them. Another leader in the organization said, you know, Geneva Conventions, they're not all that useful to us here. We should turn to the Star Trek Prime Directive. And <laughs> well, he was kind of joking, but right. you know, the point here is that it, we can't turn to Star Trek in a real right, court of law. Right. Well, actually, it's interesting. I'm going to take a very short break here, but when we come back, we'll take a deeper look at those legal implications of robotic warfare. So don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back. What happens when robots fight our wars? With more and more soldiers conducting operations remotely from their computer screens, miles away from any conflict zone, are modern armies dehumanizing the enemy? And if so, what are the legal implications? From Geneva, my guest is Philip Alston, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial ju Killings. And from his office at the Brookings Institute here in Washington, D.C., is P.W. Singer, author of Wired for War, The Robotics Revolution and Conflict in the 21st Century. Getting back to some questions here, a couple of emails back to back. And Professor, if I could put these to you. The first one that comes from Makhawe Rolisizwe Dlodlo. Um, says, removing humans from warfare takes away accountability and gives the option of claiming technical error when innocents are killed. And one that came in from Nick Ziegler in the USA says, my fear is that when executives have the power to deploy robots rather than soldiers, it will be too easy to convince the public that war is good. Uh, professor, touching on something that um, Dr. Singer was saying, it, it's the idea that um, wars can be fought remotely and they can be fought with robotics might actually make the idea of going to war that much easier, do you think? 
Uh, I think that's right. I think we see already in the use of drones in Pakistan and a lot of the comments that have been made, hey, this is a very hard war to fight. The only way we can really do it is through these uh, drones that are not causing any casualties and so on. I think that does uh, induce the sense that it's uh, easier to go to war. The problem that really needs to be kept in mind, of course, is whether these wonderful weapons, which will become more and more sophisticated, as Dr. Singer has so uh, clearly illustrated, whether they will actually be a panacea. In other words, is it really going to help us to win the war against terror? Is it really going to help us to have uh, robots all over the place that can be taking out large numbers of people? I think we have to take a lot more account of the very serious downside of this uh, sort of warfare, the animosity that it generates, the alienation. It becomes a very good recruiting tool for those that we are trying to defeat. So it can look on paper very attractive, but in reality, I think we need to look at it very, very carefully. I want to quote uh, Leon Panetta, the, uh, the CIA boss here in the USA, who said, there is no question that we are abiding by international law and the law of war. We have a responsibility to defend this country, and that's what we're doing. Uh, the CIA director also said, and anyone who suggests that somehow, you know, we're employing other tactics here that somehow violate international law are dead wrong. I wonder, Dr. Singer, in fact, I can add to an email we got, uh, if, if I can, from Omar Ab uh, Abdi Qadir in Kenya, who says, Will replacing humans with unmanned machines make it more difficult to identify who was behind a certain attack? Will it be more difficult to hold troops accountable? Here, here the, the CIA boss is saying, you know, we're abiding by international law, but of course, this, this accountability issue comes up again. Well, I think the, the real challenge with the CIA role in this is that um, it's, a, it's a couple issues here. One is, it's who's doing it. This is um, the predator and the armed predator is a weapon of war. And I think a concern a lot of people have is that when it's being conducted by the CIA, it's falling outside of the normal um, system of accountability that we have for war. That is, it, the military side of this, um, if something goes wrong, we have a clear chain of command to figure out who's responsible. We have a system of laws in place, a court martial system to hold those uh, accountable. But the CIA side, um, one, it's being claimed that they're doing this, you know, uh, that they're covert operations, and yet we all know about it, so it's not really meeting that standard. But the other is, Panetta's statements really fall into the realm of just trust us. Uh, we don't know what is the system of um, the chain of command there that's leading these. We don't know what the rules of engagement are. And so in many a areas here, it's not so much the, the finding that they are committing a war crime, rather it's just the unanswered questions. And I think that's really the fundamental difference when you're talking about using this weapon in an overt operation versus using it in what was supposed to be a covert operation mm -hmm. but really isn't meeting that standard right now. And Professor Olson, how much are things complicated by the increased use of private mili military contractors? We've seen the difficulties this has created in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, but presumably if technology is put in the hands of private military contractors, the issue of accountability and certainly international answerability is, is going to be very clouded. I think it's all part of the same picture. Uh, obviously, the laws of war are basically designed to be uh, abided by, by governments with the sort of accountability mechanisms that Dr. Singer uh, indicates. And indeed, the US government and others go out of their way to say, we believe fully in these. We want to be accountable. We are. We give lots of details of civilians, uh, civilians who are hit in Afghanistan by mistake, etc. But then we move to other contexts where you've got the CIA, who will say, of course, we are clandestine, we cannot give you any details. And we get further away then by the involvement of private contractors, which is increasingly well documented. There is no way that those private contractors can effectively be held to account. So you're putting lethal weapons in the hands of private individuals who are not accountable under the laws of war. That's deeply troubling to me. And, and uh, uh, presumably, Professor Olson, with the CIA ignoring any reports like you know, the ones that you, you put forward, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make it very hard to get any kind of accountability in the end. Well, I have to say that Mr. Panetta's statement is particularly troubling. I mean, it could have been made by the head of the Russian intelligence agency. Uh, we, you get in assurances from the chief of intelligence, no, no, trust us, we're abiding by these rules, but we cannot give you even one iota of information. We can't even admit that the program is actually really happening. 
So I think that's very troubling. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Singer, there's one also, there's another issue here that technology is largely uh, uh, being developed in the Western world, in the developed world in particular. So uh, it, presumably it's, it's going to create a, a globe full of the have and have nots technologically, and, and warfare will really be uh, skewed towards the have and have nots when it comes to uh, having the latest technology. Well, um, one, that's, that's always been the case. I mean, there's always been haves and have-nots, and it just depends where in history you are as to who are the haves and who are the have-nots. But the other is, we often frame this technology as being you know, an American-only phenomena, but there's 43 other nations besides the U.S. that are um, building, buying, and using military robots right now, and they're quite global. Uh, it's nations that range from Great Britain and France to Israel to Iran to Pakistan to Russia to China to, I mean, you name it. Mm -hmm. And so the point is, is that it's a very global phenomena. The other aspect of it is that it's not just state actors that are starting to utilize this. And another legal question is really, who should be allowed to utilize this technology? Right. You mentioned the realm of private military contractors, but we also have had, for example, terrorist and insurgent groups that have been interested in this technology. Uh, we had the war between um, Israel and Hezbollah, and it was a war in which both sides utilize unmanned aerial systems. And so, really, this technology is proliferating, and we need to wrap our hands around all the various questions that ripple out from it. And Dr. Singer, just 30 seconds, literally, I mean, there's the other issue is that uh, we've seen guerrilla warfare succeed against technology, too, in places like Afghanistan. I exactly. Technology is not a silver bullet solution to all your problems. It's just a tool. It's just a means. It raises deep questions, but it doesn't provide all the solutions. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Olson, I thank you for joining us from Geneva, sir. Uh, interesting debate. Well, hopefully we'll get a chance to revisit it sometime soon. Thank you for being with us. Remember, you can follow the show on Facebook where you'll find information on upcoming shows and catch previous episodes. You can also give us your questions and chat with our global audience about the program. On the next show, crunching the numbers on the Football World Cup. Why does Brazil deliver and England disappoint? Why is Germany so consistent and Italy so unpredictable? We'll analyze those trends and ask if there's a method to this madness. Make sure you tune in for that. Me and the team, we'll see you next time.